with a lecture series that's been running since 1984, and having been to all of them, I was trying to work out if anybody else here had been to all of them. There's some have been a lot. I'm not sure if Jenny went to the first one, or she, though she was sort of in the, on the scene, clearly. Anyway, since 1984, the first one was held in Adelaide. It's also been my pleasant duty to introduce a speaker on all those occasions, except one. Introducing tonight's speaker presents me with an interesting challenge. In years past, I could talk about a Nobel laureate's contribution to economics, or in fact a recent Nobel laureate's contribution to literature and freedom, as Michael mentioned, or a freedom-loving politician, now the president of his country, talking about the end of socialism, or last year's historian talking about the end of empires. I probably couldn't have imagined that, that one day I, as a classical, libertarian, a classical liberal or a libertarian by philosophical disposition, would be introducing someone who in an earlier life was a member of something called the Revolutionary Communist Party, <laughs> and who was a regular contributor to a magazine called Living Marxism. It turns out, though, that is exactly what I'm doing tonight, and I am pleased that I am. Frank Faridi was born in Hungary, and in 1956, his family moved to Canada after the failed uprising. He did his undergrad undergraduate studies there at McGill University, moving to, uh, to the UK in 1969, where he completed his postgraduate studies at London University. His early academic work was devoted to the study of imperialism and race relations, but in recent times, he has turned to exploring the sociology of risk, and more, re and more recently, education and the broader sweep of ideas. On his university website he says, as a humanist scholar committed to the promotion of an intellectually engaged public life, I have sought to reflect on the contemporary challenges facing education, culture and intellectual life. He outlines his ideas in his book, Where Have All the Intellectuals Gone? Confronting 21st Century Philistinism. Other books, and there's some outside, you can go and get him to sign them for you later on, as well as paying for them. Uh, other books include The Politics of Fear, Beyond Left and Right, Therapy Culture, Cultivating Vulnerability in an Uncertain Age, and Wasted, Why, educa why Education Isn't Educating. Most of his academic career has been spent at the University of Kent, where he has recently stepped back from a full-time position to concentrate more on writing and public commentary. He's also a visiting professor at University College London. He publishes widely in the media and has a regu regular column, which you may have seen, in the Weekend Australian, as well as writing for other outlets such as The Guardian, The Financial Times, The New Scientist, and many more worldwide. Plus, of course, Spiked, the online weekly that you should all bookmark. Uh, perhaps, perhaps Frank will remind you again, Spiked is really worth getting, and it's free. Uh, he also comments regularly on radio and television and has been doing so since he arrived here on Saturday. Frank is now turning his mind to the problems of authority today. This is a core part of his lecture tonight and the reason I invited him to speak. At the height of the global financial crisis, but more generally as well, I felt people had lost confidence in the very institutions that had brought us prosperity and freedom. Some senior business people, in fact, who I'd spoken to, wondered whether the, the GFC had marked the end of capitalism. I thought that really is highlighting a problem of trust in something pretty fundamental. Subsequent events, of course, are telling quite a different story about what is failing, particularly in Europe, and who knows where this is going to end. Frank has participated in a number of CIS activities since he first came here as a participant at our annual concilium in Queensland several years ago. And he always makes you think about the subjects he discusses. His latest book is on tolerance, and he'll be addressing this and the vital issue of freedom of speech, which, of course, in Australia at the moment, with all these done inquiries, uh, has become really uh, very important. And he'll be talking about that in a public lecture in Melbourne on Thursday evening. So now it gives me great pleasure to invite Professor Frank Faridi to deliver this year's John Bonython Lecture. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for that introduction, Greg. And uh, I'm really pleased to be here. So I think it's a real privilege for me to be part of the uh, cohort of individuals giving a lecture uh, annually on, on this particular platform. I think it's particularly uh, important for us to think about what's going on in the world 
and about the way in which ideas about leadership have become so confused and so troublesome, uh, especially in the United States and in the European uh, sort of context. And in fact, it's become in many ways one of the central questions facing us. Uh, in every circumstance, whether you're in business or in the public sector, or where you're looking at the uh, mess that's been created by politicians, one of the questions that, in a sense, confronts us is who is going to lead us out of this mess? Who is going to come up with the solutions to overcome many of the obstacles and the challenges that we face? But eight years ago, I became first interested in the question of leadership when I was asked to attend uh, a conference or a seminar run by NATO a year after 9-11. And one of the issues that was raised in this uh, meeting in Brussels uh, by the people uh, who, who run NATO was to figure out what to do in case a European capital city experienced a devastating, catastrophic attack that was comparable to what happened in New York in 9-11. And the question they were asking is, uh, imagine that something like a, a major uh, a terrorist attack occurred in Paris or in London or in Brussels. Who would you trust in those circumstances to go on television and tell the people what had happened? Who would you trust to talk to the public and give them guidance or to tell them how to go about making up the hard decisions you know, who would you trust? And at first, all of us, being senior academics, said, well, that's an easy question. It's a, what's the problem here? Until the Italian chaps got up and said, well, you know, really, Berlusconi, you know, Berlusconi isn't going to do the business. You know, sort of, if, if we had a, a major catastrophic event in Rome, you don't want Berlusconi anywhere <laughs> near a, a, a television studio. And then, you know, the... Colleagues from Belgium got up and said, well, look, in Belgium, we haven't got a government. You know, we haven't got a prime minister. And they spent a very long time figuring out, I think they spent about a day and a half until they decided that probably in Belgium, they would look to the king. You know, he's a symbol of unity. Not very charismatic, but, you know, why not? The king will do the, do the business. And then it came to us, people living in Britain, who would we choose? And it became very obvious to all of us regardless of our political affiliations, that Tony Blair wasn't the man for the job. Because by that time, he had lost a lot of credibility. People kind of regarded Blair as, as essentially a, a bit of a creation of spin doctors, had no real conviction. And although he was a, you know, still a, a serious statesman and individual, he wasn't the kind of person you wanted to rely on in a wartime disaster-related situation. So after prolonged discussion, we looked at every possibility, we came up with the name of Trevor MacDonald, who, if you don't know, is a, is a Caribbean newscaster, Carib or Caribbean origin newscaster, who is reasonably trustworthy. He's very mellow in the way he speaks. He's reliable. He's there every night. And on balance, we figured, you know, sort of he's somebody that the people would believe in. If he, had, if he, if he said, you know, there's a quarantine on in London, you mustn't come into the city, you gotta go in this direction. We'd rather have Trevor McDonald telling the people what to do than our elected leaders. And in every single uh, sort of delegation at that committee, we more or less came up with some bizarre ideas, which were actually a reflection of the fact that we felt that neither us who were there as experts, nor the public could really have confidence in people who had a formal claim to leadership, who were in office, they had the official title, prime minister, president, and all the rest of that, but they weren't really kings. And that was then. So in many respects, the issues that were raised in, uh, this was in 202, uh, haven't really gone away. And as you know, in Europe today, we got a situation where the problem of leadership has, if anything, become even more intensified, even more self-evident. And in fact, uh, a couple of days ago, I got an email from a friend in Milan, and he said, uh, did you know that Mario Monti is going to become the prime minister of Italy? 
And I said, no, I didn't. And who is Mario Monti was my question, because I never heard of the guy, you know, sort of. Uh, I did hear him, but I, I didn't think of the same Mario Monti, because the Mario Monti I knew was a, an individual who's never been in an election in his life. He's never ran for elected office. Mario Monti has never led anything. I mean, the only thing he's ever led was a seminar discussion in a university, <laughs> you know, sort of a, a while back, and I'm sure he's a, a very sweet seminar leader and a, and a clever economist and an academic, but he's never been put to the test. You know, and you think of Italy and its heritage of leadership, you know, people like Dante, Petrarch, Michelangelo, Garibaldi, and then Mario, you know, sort of, <laughs> it, it kind of uh, beggars belief what has happened. And, you know, no sooner do you hear that Mario Monti has become the Prime Minister of Italy. Uh, by the way, before he was made Prime Minister of Italy, the President of Italy appointed him as lifelong member of the Senate. It's a very interesting idea they have in Italy. You don't have to run for the Senate. You don't have to get elected, but you become appointed for life. It's like a lifelong sentence for the nation. You know, a, you know, a sort of, Mario will be there forever. But no sooner do you hear that uh, he's been made prime minister by this weird process of selection, then you also discover that Lucas Papademos in Greece, who's also an economist, who also has a, imp an impressive track record in running seminar discussions, but again, has never been elected, you know, is now leading Greece. So now we're told that, don't worry, the, the crisis of leadership has been sorted in Europe because two economists, very nice guys, and the good economists, but not necessarily a leader of a country, have been made prime ministers. And you just know that uh, the problems of European society are going to get even more intense and even more complicated because what has happened is that we've avoided confronting yet again the question of leadership, of how you deal with challenging situations, how you basically tell the electorate, how you, deal, how you tell the public that we've got some mighty big problems and I'm here to embrace those problems. I'll be honest with you, I'll deal with them properly and lead you out of this mess. So instead of saying that we've appointed people behind the backs of the electorate, uh, in a way that is actually an insult to freedom, democracy, in the way that one understands it. So in a sense, we do have a very big problem, and we talk about leadership all the time. I mean, leadership has become one of those things where uh, there is a constant stream of literature in England or in France or America, if you're, if you're in business, you will inevitably get an email once a week that will tell you that we're running a, a new seminar on leadership. Or, you know, or if you want, send your employees to a conference you're organizing to train them to become leaders. So there's a, a real industry that claims to turn ineffectual executives <laughs> into formidable leaders through a two-day away day program, <laughs> you know, sort of where they're gonna bond and realize their potential. And just in case the away day the leadership of where they hasn't succeeded, all you gotta do is go to any good bookshop. And I'm sure it's the same in Sydney as in London or New York. And if you go to any good bookshop, you go to the leadership section. There's a leadership section now. And you will find dozens of texts that guarantee to make you into a leader. So, for example, if there's anybody in this room who's interested in becoming a leader, you can read a book with a title, The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. <laughs> follow them and people will follow you. I love that, you know, follow them and people will follow you. Now, if 21 is too high a number for you, you kind of, <laughs> you kind of feel challenged by that. Then you can uh, read, for example, the leadership book, How to Deliver Outstanding Results or there's a book called How to Lead, What You Actually Need to Do to Manage, Lead, and Succeed. And there's my favorite book, which I recommend to people uh, who want to understand why we have such a problem. It's a book called Primal Leadership, Learning to Lead with Emotional Intelligence. <laughs> and what this book does is it kind of combines psychobabble, you know, kind of old-fashioned psychobabble, you know, 
find your real self, you know, sort of, and, <laughs> and kind of be emotionally sensitive, you know, sort of, all that stuff, we kind of, Harvard Business Review managers, managers speak. I mean, that's the best way I can put it. But uh, you can read the whole book and uh, spend hours studying it, and I can guarantee that you will turn into a lot of things, but, but not a leader. <laughs> I think the problem with these books, and, and I'm not against reading. I think reading is really good. So, you know, <laughs> it's, an, it's a kind of good read to take away on a beach holiday. The problem with these books is that there's actually no formula for becoming a leader. It's not something you can get from reading books. One of the problems that uh, we have when it comes to leadership is that although there are many things we all need to learn to become leaders, there are many things that we need to learn, there are many things that you need to learn that cannot be taught. Right? That's, the, that's the paradox. Often the most important things in life, how to have a good relationship, how to be good at managing other people, how to uh, cultivate uh, a presence in a boardroom or how to cultivate a presence in public life are things you have to learn, but nobody can really teach you. Those are things you have to learn for yourself through talking about those issues with your, with your friends by learning from your experience. I mean, there's an intuitive element to leadership that you cannot bypass. You cannot somehow miraculously go on a training course and, 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 and get those uh, ideas. And I know that in, in the business world now, we have more facilitators than rats. You know, sort of everybody uh, becomes a facilitator. And we have all these mentors that are meant to be taking you aside and turning you into these phenomenally uh, confident individuals. But really, when you scratch the surface, you realize at the end of the day, the only people that can really help you are your, are your friends, your mates, and your colleagues. The, people with whom you've got an organic relationship with anyway, but it's a common shared experience on which you can build on. And that's the way it goes in business. That's pretty much the way it goes in public life and in all domain of social experience. So the bad news is, is that there is no way in which you're going to become a leader by reading books or by going on training courses or by looking for mentors and facilitators and all these people to tell you how to do the business. And at the end of the day, leadership, as you all know, if you're in business, is a lonely experience. It's a very lonely experience. There are, there are those moments when you realize that you're out on your own, you've got to do something that is a little bit unpopular, that may really provoke a lot of anger and anxiety on the part of people that you're very close to and you love, but you still got to do it. And you realize that that's not something you can outsource to your PA, right? It's not something you can you know, let a consultant do for you. I mean, it's very attractive. And I know some people in business, uh, whenever they're confronted with a situation like that, make a phone call to a consultant and could you bring two guys along here and, and tell my workforce you know, sort of what I want them to tell, but I, I'm too scared to say myself. Uh, that's not going to make you into a, a leader uh, by any stretch. So the question becomes, how can, you know, what, what is a leader? How, do, how can we cultivate leadership amongst ourselves? Because you can never be uh, good enough as a leader. There's always more to learn. And how can we create a, a culture in public life that takes leadership seriously, that uh, creates the environment where we can begin to deal and confront with all these complicated economic and political problems that are, uh, that are you know, really in front of our eyes and part of our day-to-day -day experience. To make a long story short, it seems to me there is three interrelated attributes that are necessary for leadership. These are uh, attributes that uh, have been recognized for a very, very long time. They're not particularly complicated. You don't need a PhD in managerial behavioral psychology to kind of grasp them. but even though they're fairly simple and obvious, they are difficult to attain because at the end of the day, it depends on our experiences rather than on, simply on our act of will. And these three interrelated dimensions of leadership are, first of all, the capacity to initiate. Secondly, the capacity to establish a presence. And thirdly, and most importantly, and most 
One that's the most difficult of all is the capacity to know how to judge, to know how to make judgment calls. These are the three interrelated dimensions of leadership that political leaders need, people that lead countries, as well as leaders of institutions. Now, ever since the beginning of time, ever since the days of ancient Greece, it's been recognized that these uh, attributes of leadership were very, very important. So, for example, if you look at the old Greeks in ancient Greece, they had a name for government. And the name they had for government is called Archi, or Archie, as I call it, because I can never pronounce the old Greek words. And the etymological meaning of Archi, A-R-C-H-E, is actually, although it means government, what it really means is uh, the capacity to be the person that takes the first step. Very simple idea. It, it, government means you are the one that takes that first step. It also means foundation. It means laying the foundation for something. And when you look at the discussions in, among Greek philosophers, what they were always really getting at is that he who opens their mouth first, initiates, starts something that wasn't there before, is the one that is worthy of leaders. In other words, it's leading from the front is the way we call it now. But in the, as far as the Greeks were concerned, it had to do with initiating it and starting something. And what's very interesting is that the Romans, who kind of borrowed a lot of their ideas from the Greeks, but then became even more effective as global leaders, because the Roman Empire was really a laboratory for leadership for centuries and centuries, what the Romans did was to take the idea of the Greeks of initiating leadership and develop the concept of what they called auctoritas. And what auctoritas means in Latin, it's a very difficult word to translate into English because the simplest translation is authority. But what auctoritas also means is the, it's the root of the English word author. In other words, through auctoritas, you author something. You, you kind of put in place, you put in motion something. And the act of authoring is almost like giving birth, but you're giving birth either to an idea or to a decision or to a policy. And when you, when you read uh, the, the great Latin writers, the Roman writers, when they talk about auctoritas, they're very interesting. They always make the point, and for example, the great Roman emperor Augustus always said, I've conquered the world, you know, I'm the first real emperor of Rome, I'm the richest person in Rome, but that doesn't really matter, that doesn't count for very much. I've got the strongest military presence in the Roman Empire, but that doesn't really matter very much either. I've got all these titles, I'm called emperor, I'm, I'm the, uh, the leader of the Roman religion at the time. That doesn't matter, I, what, I, what I do have and what really matters is I got auctoritas. And what he meant was that my authority, my leadership is not given to me by my office because anybody can get an official title, anybody can get a nameplate saying I'm senator this or I'm tribunai that. What I've got is, is something that only comes from people trusting me, only comes from having the capacity to invite people's trust and belief in what I'm saying. And I think when you look at his, his legacy and what he wrote, you can really understand how the Romans grasp the essence of initiating, that, the, of understanding that real leaders are individuals who emerge by demonstrating their capacity to initiate and to gain trust. They're not the ones that are made life senators. They're not the ones that are appointed as commissioners. They're not the ones that have a big nameplate and million diploma around their walls telling the world how important they are. People just know that they're leaders because they got auctoritas. So that's the uh, first important quality of leadership, the capacity to initiate. And I think that's always important for us to uh, sort of bear in mind. Now the important thing about auctoritas, and what's really uh, nice about it, is you don't need to be particularly uh, an unusually charismatic person to have it. People often think that only one or two people can be leaders. Everybody else needs to be followers. But one thing that we learned through human history is that the capacity to become leaders, to initiate, 
is not something that, you know, is just a natural attribute that only those people have. It's something you can cultivate yourself. Something that anybody that's committed to a, a business or to a cause or to an institution, anybody can cultivate that so long as they have three uh, important uh, sort of uh, attributes in, in the course of doing that. I think the first thing is responsibility, a sense of responsibility for what you're initiating. Secondly, a kind of passion about what it is you, you're about about your cause, about your institution, about your business, about your idea. And finally, uh, and, and very importantly, is commitment. The commitment to see that through. And once you have that, then in invariably, uh, you are able to take part in that initiation and initiate things. But when you do that, you, you develop the second attribute of leadership, which is a presence, establishing a presence. I don't know how to describe or talk about presence, but you know yourself that there are individuals who have a presence. You, know, you go into a room, and for some reason, they got a presence. And you know, they're there, and they, they strike you as being different than anybody else. And the way that I explain to myself is why it is that these are leaders with a presence, the way I understand it myself is this. The reason why they have a presence is because their presence is not based on the, the, them talking about themselves. It's not really about uh, individuals showing off, showing off and saying how great they are and how brilliant they are. The presence that they have comes about through their ability to personify just what it is they're about. You know, it could be personifying the product they're selling. You know, actually living the life of that business. It could be personifying the cause that they're trying to convert people to adopt. It could be uh, a presence that's, that's established through resonating with, with individuals in that room in relation to a subject that touches us all. But the capacity to have a presence comes about through initiating, through commitment, responsibility, and in that whole process of being passionate about what it is you're, 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 you're kind of putting forward, I think real presence can be established by even individuals who otherwise are shy, lack charisma, you know, are the kind of individuals we sometimes call socially awkward, not the life of the party, but in that particular moment, they are able to do the business. The third, and what I think is the most important uh, challenge for leaders, one that all of us have got to confront and deal with on a daily basis, nobody can evade that, is judgment, the capacity to make judgment calls. It's, it really goes back to um, a, an old virtue that, that the Greek philosopher Aristotle put forward. I, I'm really sorry that I'm talking so much about Greeks and Romans. I never do that. Um, but I really feel that they had some very interesting ideas that uh, provide us with a very strong foundation for building uh, a leadership culture in the 21st century. What Aristotle argued, he said, look, there are many, many virtues that are important. Many virtues like courage, really important. Obviously, you cannot be a leader without courage. You know, honesty, being moral, being good. But he said the most fundamental virtue of all the, the, the first virtue on which every other virtue is built is what he called the virtue of phronesis. Phronesis basically means practical wisdom. And what practical wisdom really means is the capacity to make judgment calls about what needs to be done. It's, you, you, know, you are confronted with a dilemma. And we all are, every day we have dilemma. You are confronted with making a decision. You know, you are confronted with how to push through something that's important but unpopular. You are confronted with deciding, are you going to have that fight with your, with your colleagues today, or are you going to wait a few days until uh, it's better to have it out? All of those things call for phronesis, or for lack of a better English word, discretion, using your discretion. Now, you might say, well, 
That's a devastatingly simple, even simplistic idea. Discretion. I mean, why go on about discretion? But you know, exercising discretion is one of the most difficult things uh, that we have to do. It's one of the most challenging uh, of, 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 of attributes that we're confronted with in a, in a regular basis because all of our lives, in every domain of our experience, we're encouraged not to exercise discretion. I mean, I, I realized this uh, a few years ago when I was writing a book on education. And I couldn't understand why it was that when you talk to children, they said, those are really good teachers. They're really brilliant teachers, whereas those are just really boring. They just want to be our friends. They're just, you know, flattering us. They're just, you know, not doing anything. And then you realized that the teachers that they liked were the ones that were continually using their discretion. They weren't just following a curriculum in a kind of automatic, boring kind of a way. They were making judgment calls about what that child needed on that particular day. And that was what a good teacher was. A, a good teacher is by definition potentially a good leader. And that's something that we kind of confronted with everywhere in, in every uh, aspect of our, of, of our life. Now, now I think what I'd like to do is to actually sort of come to what, what is in many ways the, the real problem of leadership. Because you see, the paradox that we're confronted with is that everybody swears that leadership is important and leadership is necessary. It's very difficult to meet people that are against leadership. The only people that are against leadership are the protesters out on the streets who basically think that any form of hierarchy is a bad thing. But most human beings recognize and, 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 and look to people to lead them in, in many aspects of their lives. So we all know it's really important. But even though we all know it's a really important challenge that confronts our society, the way we organize our life, paradoxically, is to make leadership impossible. In particular, the way that life is organized in, in the Western world is to stigmatize and to marginalize the capacity to make judgment calls. You know, in, in many institutions in the West, discretion is no longer regarded as an attribute, as a positive attribute. Discretion is regarded as something you need to abolish. In fact, in many organizations, we have rule books and codes of conduct that prevent you from being, you know, sort of using discretion. For example, you might run a business and uh, in England, if you run a business, you might say, well, that woman there is really excellent. She's just exactly what I need to run uh, those, uh, those departments of my business. And because she's so good, I'm going to carve out a job for her. You know, I'm going to get her in there to sort out the problem. That's how a leader w thinks and works. In England, you cannot do that. You cannot say that that woman is going to be the new manager of those departments, because that's discrimination against, I don't know, albinos or against people with you know, sort of hearing difficulties. It doesn't really matter. That's just seen as a, a form of discretion. So what you've got to do is you've got to spend a lot of time organizing an interview panel. And the interview panel cannot be your mates in the way that you'd want to. You know, people who you trust, who you, who, who you know, are going to make the right judgment call. They've got to represent the world. So they've got to be people that can barely spell the word business, never mind run one. They've got to be people who are you know, reflecting social experience. So you have the interviews, and then you've got to have at least six people. Now, you already decided you know who you want to employ, but you then got to go through the motion of interviewing every single individual. But what's even interesting, you see, because you could be surprised. You could get a person who you think is really good. You, you did not, didn't think of that person. And you want to ask them some questions about, you know, well, how come I never heard of you? Where do you come from? Who are you? The trouble is you cannot ask those questions because that's discrimination as well. You go to ask the same questions of every single candidate. So all six people, you know, whether they're short or tall, you know, whether they speak English or they don't speak English, you all go to ask them the same kinds of questions. And the whole idea behind this form of interviewing 
is that you never ever get a chance to make a judgment call. You're not allowed to use discretion. You gotta work according to a formula, according to a script written by somebody else. Usually, uh, there's one guy in London who writes human resources templates for every business. And it's interesting, every business or public sector organization go to, the human resources rules are the same. And you ask the question, well, why is it that somebody that's working in mining and somebody that's running a, a home for old age pensioners or, or somebody that's running a super, why are they having the same script that they need to talk to? And of course, this guy's making a lot of money because he's, you know, he's got a monopoly on these rule books that are being sold. But the one thing that isn't happening is you're not able to use discretion. You're not able to use your judgment call under those kinds of circumstances. So it seems to me that what has happened is that businesses and public sector organizations and political institutions have become discretion-free zones. You can, you can do many things, but the one thing you're not allowed to do is to make judgment calls. From a bureaucratic perspective, the proliferation of these rules are often called best practice. Uh, best practice, and usually when they talk about best practice, what they really mean is that these are the practices that make it impossible for anybody to act as a leader. That's why they best practice. It's best practice for the people uh, that live by the rules, die by the rules, and they spend all their time you know, following the template. And it seems to me that under those circumstances, we have a very big problem in leading the world to confront the issues that we're, that we're dealing with today. One of the things that judgment does, and what's really beautiful about the act of judgment, is that through an act of judgment, you convert the uncertainties that you face, the problems that, the dilemmas that you're confronted with, into risks that are calculable. See, through an exercise of discretion, what you can do is you can embrace uncertainty and turn that uncertainty into, into empirically given risk that you can then calculate. And, and through using your judgment, you end up controlling uncertainty instead of just simply uh, being overwhel overwhelmed by it. And in a sense, what happens is that the more you judge, the more you use your discretion, the more you cultivate the habit of leadership, the better you become at giving a lead and giving it a, a direction. Now one final important point I'd like to make, which is that leadership is intimately linked to gaining authority. It's, it's authority and being authoritative is essential to leadership. Well, one of the problems that we have in Western institutions is that authority is increasingly seen as a bad thing. In fact, if you go on Google, and you search authority, you'll find that authority is always linked to abuse of authority. Or authority is always described as being authoritarian. Or when you talk about authority, it's always represented as a really heavy guy, you know. Why is he ego tripping this person? That's what authority is invariably represented. And what we've done is that in because we're so uncomfortable with authority, we're penalizing people who are in some shape or form trying to take initiative. A year ago, I was asked to give a talk on risk and authority to a group of businessmen in London. And these were probably the, the 200 most influential risk managers of businesses and, and legal risk managers of these businesses. And I was there to give the other point of view you know, sort of why they should take risks. And I, and I kept quiet all the way through the discussion because these were, in my, you know, sort of uh, simplistic imagination, the enemy. And I figured, I'll listen. I'm not going to say very much, and I'll just go away because they're not going to be interested in what I'm saying anyway. Until this woman got up, who's a director of a very big uh, sort of uh, utility company in England, and she basically said something that I heard many, many times before. She said, you know, in our organization, we take risk very seriously. By that she meant that, like every other organization, they have a 400-page risk assessment document. Again, written by the same person that writes. <laughs> so 
So anyways, we take very, risk very, very seriously. And then she said, in fact, we take it so seriously that we don't just simply have two or three people manage the risk. Every employee in our organization is a risk manager. Have you ever heard that in Australia when somebody says, in our organization, everybody is a risk manager? I heard it so many times. And at that point, I had this kind of religious revelation. You know, you get that sometimes when, the, when that kind of bulb lights up. And I said, well, I didn't actually say it at that point. I said it later on. I said, well, if everybody is a risk manager in your organization, who do you employ to take risks? I mean, who do you employ to take risks? And also, by the way, does anybody work in your organization? <laughs> I mean, if you're all managing risks and you're kind of looking at the documents, does anybody actually do any work, anything productive? Right. And, and the minute you begin to sort of uh, kind of question this kind of approach, you begin to realize that all these documents, all this talk, is very much designed to prevent you from initiating something. And one of the things I'm concerned about with is that although we are aware of all the regulation that goes on in terms of taxation and, 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 and in terms of economic life, and we react against it, we often are, are, are ignorant of the fact that regulation takes place on a micro level within institutions where we basically regulate every bit of interaction that goes on in every single department where there's a code of practice, there's an ethics committee, there is a risk assessment document, something, a health and safety rule that basically tells us how to behave, how to, how to act in those kinds of circumstances. So what I'm really trying to say is that when you have a process-driven culture, when process becomes everything, when things that are good or bad are decided by the process rather than by you as a leader deciding what that organization needs, then we actually end up with some very big problems. We end up with some really big trouble in, in, a, in a very kind of obvious sense. So basically, I just want to end up by making a very simple point, something that we, I think, all need to sort of take a little bit seriously, which is that leadership today isn't about shouting loud, isn't about having nameplates, it isn't about being special, having this incredible uh, level of charisma, leadership today is, is really about being committed towards taking risks through using our discretion, gaining authority not by managing uncertainty out of existence, by gaining authority through having embraced uncertainty and doing that in front of our colleagues on a regular basis. It seems to me that embracing uncertainty has the capacity of turning what is a potential problem into an opportunity. I mean, uncertainty doesn't need to be equated with danger. Uncertainty is not always negative. If we intelligently embrace uncertainty, what seems to us as a challenge can also turn into an opportunity for making things happen. We can use the uncertainty confronting the European continent as a way of resolving the mistakes of the past and actually transcending these difficulties by turning our crises into an opportunity. That's one way of thinking. That's one way of going forward. Now, there's no guarantee of success. If you embrace uncertainty, there's no guarantee that you will succeed. But even if you haven't succeeded in dealing with uncertainty, what you would have done is created a condition where you had gained the experiences that can provide the foundation for going on and, and giving a lead in the future. It seems to me that when you have a, an attitude towards the taking of risks, you begin to build a culture that's the very opposite to a process-driven precautionary culture. Process and precaution, which are the two hallmarks of our managerial approach at the moment, is the very, uh, very op opposite to risk-taking and leadership. It's the very opposite of that. And in many respects, what is really at stake here isn't whether you or I become leaders, isn't just about individual, it's a much more fundamental question to do with the culture that affects us in every uh, aspect of our life. And you see, what I'm really talking about is that when we fear uncertainty, when we create process 
when we create managerialisms to insulate ourselves from uncertainty, what we are really saying is that ultimately, liberty itself becomes far, far too much of a risk. I mean, can you think of anything more uncertain than exercising your freedom? I mean, one of the things about freedom is you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. It, being genuinely free means that there are no guarantees. And that's the buzz. That's what's nice about it. The nice thing about freedom is you make things happen. You know, freedom provides us with opportunities which we only discover in the course of engaging in that. So, in a sense, the embracing of, of risk is really about the affirmation of freedom and liberty. And ultimately, what's at issue here in trying to, in a sense, manage risk out of existence is, is a downgrading of the status of freedom. That's what we really are talking about, which is why you will find that when freedom is attacked within institutions, through the institutionalizational process, we don't really notice it. All we say, oh, well, that's just, you know, human resources being added again. They're always doing this thing. It's only a small thing. They're only telling us who to hire, you know, sort of, and in what circumstances. And you can say, well, that's just a small infringement on my independence and freedom. But the minute you begin to give way on the small freedoms, and the minute you give up on your right to lead an organization, the minute you stop using your initiative, what you're doing is you're giving a green light to a culture that regards liberty as something of an indulgence, something that is a bit, is a bit of an inconvenience, something that we can really do without. And they may well say that in the language of managerial talk, but they, what they are really saying at the end of the day is freedom is negotiable, which is why I think all of us in this room have got to do our best to take both leadership more seriously to use our discretion and flaunt it in the face of those people who would want to deny us their right and object to even the smallest of our freedoms being taken away from us. Because even the smallest freedom is something that all of us have got to regard as being very special. Thank you.